Blog Talk Radio. Uh, you know what time it is. Time to hang out yeah. with Mr. Cool. With Mr. Koopa, with Mr. Koopa, with Mr. Koopa, ladies cool. From Mr. Koopa, from Mr. Koopa, from Mr. Koopa. Hey, with Mr. Koopa, 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 with
You'll appreciate this, You'll I think. Appreciate this. A lot of the work was in front of jazz bands at a place called, called, called the Blues, Blues Alley. Blues Alley. Mm-hmm. And cellar door. Cellar door. And I would and get work for like opening for Tony Williams or Mose Allison or whatever. And so um, I was just starting out. So I'd be, you know, I'm, I'm a, I was, you know, a white guy from a small town. And I had not even had that experience in front of all black audiences. And one of my friends oh. in, in law school came to see me perform one night. And she was um, a black law student. I was a white law student. And so we were friends. And she said, you know, it'd be funny to say. And I go, what? She goes, when you go on stage, just say, I know what you're thinking. There goes the neighborhood. I mean, she wrote that joke for me. Are you <laughs> serious? She wrote that joke. No, I'm serious. So the next time I went on stage in front of a, you know, an audience was almost all black, I, I said that line. They broke up laughing. I did exactly the same act I was bombing with before. It got laughs. I mean, it just broke the ice. It just showed me if you recognize your truth and the truth of the situation right off the bat, the audience will go, okay, you know, like if, just say the truth of the situation. And the audience relaxed and I relaxed and everything got okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And you know what? So I, that's I how I started. I, I started, yeah, you know, you get help, you get help along the way and you got to learn your lessons. That's so true. That is so true. Um, and you know what? And I think you actually brought the new definition of breaking the ice because that's what you did. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't know it, but I was smart enough to know what she said was genius. I was smart enough to know what that that'll work. That I get that. I get that why that'll work. I mean, she knew why it would work. You know, she knew it. She wouldn't have said. It. She didn't say it by accident. She knew. She was a smart woman. So <laughs> I just was smart enough to go. You're a smart woman, and that that'll work. And it worked. And I that's what I would do. I I would use that line like you know, it was it was hilarious. That's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. And you know, Rich. Um. You know, the comedy world like, has changed. Yeah. It, it's changed from the let, – we can even take it back to the 70s. It's changed from mm-hmm. the late 70s, 80s, 90s, all the way up to now. Now, compared right. to now to back then, what type of obstacles did you have to go through, you know, to actually receive a successful career in the show? Well, for being a comedian? Yeah, yeah. Well, people weren't familiar that familiar with it. This is why when I wrote this book, I, I called it, you know, everybody else has called it that, the comedy boom, because I did a number count from 1979, the amount of stand-up comics in America, st- at the top, from the top down, from like Richard Pryor and Steve Martin and Robin Williams down to the bottom. Mm-hmm. There were about 400 stand-up comics in the whole country. There are wow. 400 stand-up comics in Toledo, Ohio now. That's all about the okay, thing. So there weren't, yeah, there weren't, there weren't a lot of stand-ups, so... There weren't places to go do it. I was in Washington, D.C. There weren't any places. People didn't know you were going to – I'd come out – when I came out to be an opening act, sometimes even if the, the person introducing me remembered to say comedian, I'd walk out. People going, what's this guy going to do? He's got no instrument in his hand. He's got no guitar. He's got no saxophone. What's he going to do? What's he just walking out to the mic to do? Is this like one more roadie going to adjust the, They just introduced me. They wouldn't even know what I was doing. People weren't that familiar with the concept of a stand-up comic. Mm-hmm. I mean, people saw it. People were around, but there wasn't like today where everybody has somebody in their family. It's like, it's like gay. Everybody has somebody in their family who's gay. Everybody has somebody in their family who does stand up comedy. Uh, right, right, and, and that is true. And that is true. And it seems like that back in the day, like you said, it was four hundred of you worldwide or or nationwide. And yeah, look yeah. at it now, it seems like anybody they see, they hear a good not not joke. They think they can jump on stage and just tell jokes is what yeah. actually made the whole world yeah. crumble. Yeah, you would. And, you, you, you know, that, uh, Andy Evans was a, a comic, um, a black comic. He's a Vietnam vet. This is I met him back then. He was starting to do it too in D.C. You know, there, there was a whole, there was so there weren't a lot of times where you could even see comics on TV, right, or see them live. Was so desperate. So Franklin Ajay was opening up for Donny Hathaway at the Cellar Door. Mm-hmm. We just we didn't we just both showed up, didn't tell, tell each other we were showing up. We just showed up because you got to see any stand-up comic that was around. You had to go see them. They just weren't around a lot to see to watch to learn how to do this. Oh wow! And Franklin the guy was so cool, man. He just said we could walked up to him, you know, as he's and, and as he was moving from like you know the they had to go outside to go back inside. They had to go outside from the dressing room to walk into the club, and so we kind of bushwhacked him, you know. 
And he was like, listen, guys, I, I got to do this show, but I'll talk to you afterwards. And he let us hang out with him between shows and after the show. And, you know, I mean, we were pestering him. I know, you know, like we had probably asked him a million questions, but he slowed us down with some fine weed. And, um, you know, it was a good time. The guys were great to each other. There weren't a lot of people around, so everybody was good to each other. Right. It was like you had your own tribe. I guess that's the best yes, way to exactly. put it. Exactly. Right. Yeah, even though we were, he didn't know us. It's like, you know, as soon as you say you were doing stand-up comedy back then, you're like, oh, you're in a, you're, you're, you're. I don't meet many people like you, especially on the road or whatever. So let's talk. Mm-hmm. And and that's what I'm talking about. And I believe back then, you know, when it was just very few of you all, um, it was easier to get along. And I believe it was easier to communicate because you're like, oh, we're we're a breed that's rare compared to everyone yeah. else. And yeah, it was that's right. to make friends and come like yeah. to like today, like you said, you might find four hundred county I mean four hundred um comedians on one part of a state by itself. Not even counting the other half of the <laughs> that's state. Right. That's, and, that's right. You know, that's right. Yeah. And, and you know, and that's why I congratulate you on Rich. You actually went through so many different eras of comedy. Yeah. And and look yeah. what you've done. You're a legend. You definitely are. Yeah. That's what you are. Now, um, Rich, since you was talking about meeting people for the first time and everything, did you have any mentors that helped you along the way in your career? Well, a lot of people that gave you advice along the way. I wouldn't say there was one person that mentor. I got advice from Rodney Dangerfield. I got advice Ooh. from uh, yeah, yeah. So Rodney would he was he had a club and I worked it you know late night like a lot of comics did back then, and hung around there to watch the older comics working, the guys who would come through there that would work you know. Mm-hmm. Um, um, he had all those old guys who come through. So, so even Red Fox, even, Red even, Fox, even uh, of even, course uh, Jack uh, Mace and all those Mace guys would come into his clubs. You watched them, and then if you're lucky, afterwards you could sit around and listen to them talk in the bar. Just sit on the outside of the circle, you know, nice. fly on the wall, listen to them talk. And so the guys, I got advice in that way. I got, I got you know advice from Phyllis Diller. I got she gave me a lot of advice. I became friends with her. And then there was guys okay. who, along the way, you could talk to Steve Martin or Robert Klein that would give me advice. Wow. So out of all the people that you've met early in your career and everything, um, who would you say the top three comedians that gave you the best advice for your career? Who would you say that would be? Well, it would be, you know, Phyllis Diller, and it would be Steve Martin, and that would be uh, Rodney Dangerfield. I, I put Klein up there, too, but. You're definitely Rod. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Now, um, nice. in in your opinion, though, Rich, how have um, comedy or comedians changed from the 80s and 90s up to 2016? What would you say the big difference well, is? There's so many more of them. You know, um, George Burns once said that the comedic soul is eternal. Like, I don't think the personality of the comedian changes who they are. Mm-hmm. Like, if you take a funny person – you know, 100 years ago, they're the same kind of person they are today, the type, the personality type. But everything, you got to go through it. I mean, look, we, we didn't have to worry about publicity and back in the comedy boom. The comedy clubs were packed. All you had to do was put your little 8 by 10 picture up on the door and say, here's who this week's monkey is. And the place wow. was packed. They didn't care. They were, they were coming up to see the comedy, not any particular person at first. And now look at everything that comics have to do just to get noticed. You know, they... Clubs won't book them unless they have so many Twitter followers. They they gotta have so so yeah. many different. They're doing podcasts and so many different things just to try to get noticed, just to try to put their presence out there, you know, and mm-hmm. just to get work. Get work. It's so much harder for them to get work. So true. Yeah. Do you feel, do you feel that social media has actually messed up the comedians for? I mean, you know, social media it, it's easier path for people to get noticed, and you have to put in work. Yeah. Different ways yeah. but do you think yeah. social media has harmed the comedians or helped them out no i i, I never think it's I, I think comics are better now than they ever been i think the technology just changes the 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 way comedy is done it just changes like you know before and this is this is really old but just an example glaring example in vaudeville they didn't have electronic amplifiers so there wasn't any microphone with a loudspeaker people had to basically yell their acts to get the whole theater to hear them so comics tend to be loud and brash, you know what I mean, move around a lot. 
And then mm-hmm. they got electronic amplification, and comics could start getting a little bit more quiet and conversational and talking to the mic without yelling. They could start doing impersonations of people. <laughs> so comedy changed because of the technology. So I just think the comedy changes because of the technology. So comics who who do these YouTube videos, they, they're able to get they, – they do a YouTube video differently than they would do live stand-up, right? They can get known for the YouTube video. That's true. I just think it's different. Yeah. Yep. That's very true. Now, Rich, for the people that's listening worldwide right now, I know a lot of your fans are listening right now, but for the people that's just, if it's like the younger generation that's listening right now, besides, um, well, I will name one, but the question is, could you tell some people some of the shows and some of the things you had the honor to actually grace your presence on? Um, One in particular, I remember, was that HBO special, that one night stand. That was funny to me. Yeah. Yeah, I did the, the one night stand. Uh, that was we were supposed to do it in San Francisco in '89. They had the earthquake there, so the, they moved it to Chicago. And mm-hmm. uh, I did it at the same time. Uh, the, the great, they talk about legendary Robin Harris. He, we had the same agent, so we hung out. And uh, he died there in Chicago after the night he did um, the United Center. He did the he he did his one night stand, and then like he stayed there. Two nights later, he did the United Center, like five thousand people. Came out to see wow. him. Word of mouth, man. I mean, he hasn't done anything but more than, you know, he was just yeah. word of mouth. He was getting huge. He was going to be the huge. He was going to be huge. Robin Harris was going to be huge. Everybody knew it. So um, I did the, those, you know, HBO special. I did the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I did David Letterman. I did the Tonight Show with Jay Leno. I wrote for TV shows like uh, Roseanne. Uh, I performed on Married with Children. I was uh, Al Bundy's co-worker the first eight episodes. So I did a lot of things. I, I, did a lot. I did everything I was supposed to do, Michael. Everything I was supposed to do, I did. <laughs> I can't and, blame me for not becoming a big star. I did everything I was supposed to do, boss. And, and you did. And you did. And you succeeded <laughs> top ten. You really did. <laughs> now, I, did. I have... Yes, I have one personal question. I got to know, Rich. Um, 89... When you did that HBO one night stand, do you remember yeah. before you yeah. came on the stage when you was introducing yourself? And I want to make sure I got this right. Please stop me if I'm wrong. You introduced yourself and you got a pie slapped in your face. Oh, it was oh, that was that, yeah, yeah. That was that was the you know you did a little video, a little little video you did separately than the live performance, right? But I did. Yeah. I got the pie slapped in my face. That's right. That was my idea. We we tried to do we were trying to do some other things and nothing was working. So I said, you got any, because we were at the studio, I said, get, get, a, get a pie. Just get a pie filled with whipped cream and slap me in the face and hit me with seltzer water. Like classic <laughs> old comedy. So, yeah. Now, even though you knew it was coming, did it still startle you in any type of way? When you were in <laughs> yeah. first yeah. yeah, I Yeah, I couldn't see it coming. You couldn't really see it coming because, you know, the lights are on you and the camera's there. And the, 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 the woman, I think there was a woman that hit me with the pie. It was right up to the side out of my vision. I couldn't really see it. So I didn't know exactly when it was going to hit me. <laughs> and, and the reason why I asked that question, Rich, because if you go back and watch that video, when you first get slapped in the face with the pie, <laughs> your head jerks back. And I'm like, Rich, you just come. <laughs> and then well, you get you know, a one shot on you. I was you like, know, there's no if way it's a you pie, can come. It wasn't a fist, man, but it was a pie. But still, when something hits you in the face, you jerk back a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I did. I have to go look at it again. That's great. <laughs> yes. Do it. As soon as you get hit with a pie, your head jerks back. Even though your face is sealed up, watch your head. You look like you're, okay. you're ducking a sway from Mike Tyson or something. That's what it looked like, but that was funny. It really was. Yeah. Okay. So how was it behind the scenes working? Even though you was on eight episodes, how was it behind the scenes working on Married with Children with Al Bundy? Well, you know, I, I wrote it in a book. I put in a, a story about it in a book that, you know, I, I kind of stole the role from uh, Michael Moy. He was uh, – the, there were two creators, Ron Levitt and Michael Moy. And Michael Moy's friend uh, was sort of like penciled in to do the, the role, but I, I had such a good uh, – I had such a good audition that Fox wanted me to do it. So I kind of stole it from him. So – there was a little bit of tension with Michael Moy, but 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 I got to tell you, man, Ed O'Neill was a champ, man. He was great. He was he was really cool to work with. Uh, you know, he helped me a lot because I wasn't a great actor. I, I wasn't as experienced as he was, and mm-hmm. uh, he helped me a lot. And so I had fun. And I was just getting the hang of it when they dropped my character. <laughs> you know, I went, 
One day I went, hey, I think I can do this. The next day, well, you're not doing it anymore. So. <laughs> wow. Wow. You but that show is, some... brother. That show is. That's true. <laughs> and that is so true. Now, now, Rich, everyone that's listening worldwide right now, I know they're ready to hear about this. Tell everyone about the book, Kicking Through the Ashes. Let everybody know yeah. about it. Well, the book, I, I mean, I cover the, the, the whole 80s. I cover every aspect of stand-up comedy, joke thievery, heckling, joke writing. I cover all the big names from that era, you know, Robin Williams and Sam Kennison and Bill Hicks and, and Jay Leno. I cover names. I cover people who, who did comedy then and the stories about them. I have stories, a lot of stories, a lot of, you know, road stories and things that happened to television, shows that I did Letterman or whatever, Carson. And I just did my journey through that era. You know, I just covered that one era when I started in 77 and then when things blew up in 80 and then the crash in the early 90s of, of, of the comedy explosion. It just crashed in the early 90s. Mm-hmm. That, that is true. Where can everybody find the book at? Amazon.com. Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. Nice. Ladies and gentlemen, worldwide, if you're listening right now, make sure you go to Amazon. Do not go right now because we're in the middle of the interview. After the show, <laughs> go to Amazon. Order the book. Get the book kicking through the ashes. You have to read about this. Any young comedians is listening to this right now also, if you want to know how the true era started, make sure you get this book. Rich tells all. He tells it all. Make sure you get it. You will hear about the comedian, the comic legends. Like you said, like Robin Williams and more. You'll hear about him on these shows. And also, make sure you go to YouTube. Find his, um, his one-night stand special. Find Married with Children. If you got the DVDs, it, there you go. You'll see him. I'm telling you, he's doing big things. <laughs> and I believe there's more to come. Make sure you get that book, Kicking Through the Ashes. Yes. Man, um, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Now, Rich, is there, are there any other projects that you're working on that you'd like to speak about? No, well, um, uh, there's really nothing. I mean, I wrote a, I wrote an adaptation of Bill Maher's uh, book, True Story, that he wrote years ago uh, for a film for HBO, and then I'm writing a script on the first stand-up comic about the first stand-up comic. But that's about it, man. I'm just, you know, I still do stand-up. I love performing, but you know, I have no illusions. Like it's, it's taking me, you know, it's not. I'm trying to be a star or anything. This is my circling the drain tour, man. This is like just, I'm just gonna go until they, until I drop. That's it. I'm just gonna keep doing stand-up until I drop. Now. Are you willing to do this, Rich, if um, the, the legends that are still alive, if they want yeah. to do like a reunion tour, would you would you jump on it? Well, of co- I'd jump on it. Of course I would. Of course I would, man. Of course. Man. You know, man. I think that's something that needs to get together because um, I think some of the people that is just, you know, the people that's like in their teens or their early 20s, I think they need to hear the truth how the true comedians used to do it. And don't get me wrong, whoever's listening, Kevin Hart, all you guys, if you're listening right now, you guys are funny. But you know people paid the, uh, made the pass for y'all, paid the pass for you. And well, I guess there, there are, there, you mentioned Kevin Hart. There are more guys doing more theaters now than ever before. Mm-hmm. You're right. There are, more, there are more people, but there's no middle class. You know, So if you can't put butts in the seats like a Kevin Hart or whoever, you know, then you're, right. you're 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 bottom feeding. They're doing minimum wage for stand up comedy. So uh, it's true. a different era. Don't, no question, man. It's 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 definitely more than ever, man. It's more than ever, like like the kingdom or the pauper, man. It's more than ever. Have have any of these young comedians came up to you and you know asked for any advice or anything? Well, all the time. I have, I have people contacting me all the time. You know, I did this documentary, I Am Comic, when I came back. In, in 2009, and uh, and people got my phone number off of that because we put it on there as a joke. And people call me. They still call me <laughs> once in a while, and I, I talk to it. They're a young comic, and they're interested to do it. You know, the first time – this is I'll tell you this story. And, you know, this was back oh, – man, this was back in the early 90s, I guess. I okay. can't remember exactly when, but I'm working – there was a there was a D.C. comedy club called uh, uh, Comedy Cafe. And a friend of mine was waiting there, so I just came there to hang out with her. I'd finished doing a show over – another show, another place, and I came over there and she was finished up, and this young comic came up to me and he said, hey, man, I'm going to go on a minute. Would you, bother, would you watch me, man? I know who you are, you know, and would you watch me? I said, yeah, and it was Martin Lawrence. And so he comes wow. up for a show. You know, he did like 15 minutes or whatever at the end of the night. He said, what do you think? I said, move to New York, man. He goes, what? I said, you're, you're, you got it, man. <laughs> you're like, 
you could see it. He was like one of those guys. Like the first time I saw Eddie Murphy. I mean, you're, you're, you're a natural. You're, you're, you're a natural. I mean, how much material you got? You're about, about 20 minutes. Is that enough? I go, that's enough, man. Go to New York. Wow. Now you know how many times I've sold. I've told people like that around the country. I mean, I've told a lot of young comics, go to New York or go to L.A. or go to you know they'd be in some small town or not D.C. is not a small town, but it's, you know it's not an entertainment right. mecca. And they would not. I'd never hear from him again. So I gave him my number. And like a couple months later, he calls me up. He says, I'm in New York now. He moved up here, man. I moved up here. I'm doing okay. I said, great, man. It's good. Good. You're glad you made the move. Then he calls me up again. And he says, hey, I made Star Search. I'm going to do Star Search. I'm coming out to L.A. Would you come do the sh- watch the show with me? I go, yeah. And he said, oh, can go do the show? You know, watch him. He, did, he, he, he won like one or two, and then he lost. Okay. And he goes, oh, he goes, oh man, I feel terrible. I still feel terrible, man. This show ain't for you anyway. Star Search is for you. You're bigger than this show. And the next thing I know, wow. you know, Robin Harris was supposed to host Def Jam. He was supposed to be the first host of Def Jam. And when I Robin heard Harris it. died, when he died, that's when Martin Lawrence got the, the hosting job. The next thing I know, man, I see him on Def Jam, boom, he's a big star. He's, he's just, there's guys you see, you know, you just know. They just know they got it. They got it. You can see it in the first couple times they go on stage. They got it. That's true. That's very true. Have you been in contact with Martin lately? No, no, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> long, not, not a long time, man. No. <laughs> not a long hey. time. He contacted me years ago. He was going to do a Rolling Stone magazine thing or something and said he was going to mention me, the story about me seeing him and giving him advice or whatever. But I never heard anything more about it. And uh, that was the last time I talked to him. That was years ago. Okay. Not a problem. Now, are you um, are you very active on social media? Yeah, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter. Yeah, I'm 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 as active as I don't know. I'm, I don't push it like some people, that's for sure. But I'm I'm kind of active, I guess, on Facebook. Okay, so the people that's listening worldwide right now, how could people find you and follow you on social they media? Can, to keep up. Yeah, they can they can. I'm I'm on Facebook, Rich Scheidner. It's R I T C H S H Y D N E R. They can find me on Twitter. Same thing at Rich Scheidner. I got I got a website, RichScheidner dot com. Uh, those are the ways to find me. Pretty easy to get hold of. Hey, there you go, guys. Uh, make sure you follow, follow him on social media, Facebook, Twitter. Make sure you go to check out the website. He don't have no crazy long name that's up there that makes you say, what was the name? <laughs> Look for it. <laughs> follow him. Well, it, 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 was, it, it was a difficult name, but the first guy who ever got smart with, like, just clicking one name and getting – like recognition one name was Sinbad. He was the first guy that went I went, What? I mean, you know, first time I worked with him was like, What? Sinbad? You know, you you're not gonna forget that name. That's true. That's true. Yeah. How was Sinbad when you first met him? <laughs> well, I was I was as I said in the book, I wrote in the book, I was I was drinking and doing a lot of cocaine and, uh-huh. and I was getting fat and angry and he was just starting out and he ran me no no middle act i never had any problem tr- following anybody you know i was i was i was pretty 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 good up there but sinbad he ran me he ran me hard man i had a hard time following him he's one of the guys that woke me up to like maybe i should quit drinking and doing drugs but i still want to do stand up comedy cuz it wasn't right. working for me but he was like you know he was pure he was just pure I mean, he's just drinking coca cola and he was killing up there he was just one of those guys that like Material was almost like an afterthought. People just loved this guy. They just wanted to, he just made him laugh. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Now, Mr. Shotner, um, what would you say is your ultimate goal as a comedian? Wow. I don't have, I, I don't have any goals anymore. To tell you the truth. I just don't have, I mean, I, I had goals when I was younger. I wanted to be, you know, I have a sitcom. I wanted to you notice know, things. I wanted to be in movies. Those things I wanted to do. And I didn't mm-hmm. in small ways, right? But I, and uh, but I had pilots that didn't get turned into sitcom, and I got little small roles and things. But I don't have that anymore. I just I just want to wherever I can go to perform and make people laugh or entertain them, I'll, I'll do it. But I I have no more goals. Okay, so you've accomplished everything in the comedy world that you. I, I, I'm just you know, I'm 64, man. I'm 64. I mean, it's, it's hey. all the people my age. The kingdoms have been settled, man. The, the the castles are built. Whoever's got them, got them, man. You know what I mean? Hey, I'm, I'm like happy you doing what I'm doing. 
But you never know, Mr. Shiner. It may be the point where, you know, we will tease you back. <laughs> Man, <hold on. laughs> you know that it, it, it's comedian not, not joke may not be as funny anymore. <laughs> so Yeah. You know, I was gonna say if there's some sort of specific specific virus that attacks only comedians under the age of sixty four, I may become the biggest comic in America. <laughs> I like that. I definitely like that. Okay. Now right. Mr. Shiner, um I, I know you're a busy man, so I'm not gonna hold you yeah. long. But um, okay. what advice would you give any male or female that wants to become a comedian um, on stand-up or even in television or movies? Well, my advice for any comic who wants to do stand-up is if you want to do it, you got to take a shot. You can't be somebody that turns 40 or 50 and says, I should have tried. I wish I had tried. If you're young and you think you want to do it, do it. Do it. Don't think twice. Just do it. And get up as many times as you can all the time. Anywhere you can, any audience, get in front of audience. I remember going out in Washington uh, Square trying to trying to do comedy and, and there. I mean, I'd go on the street. I was terrible on the street, but I'd try anywhere. I'd go anywhere. I went into pizza places and talked to them and let me do a stand-up comedy where people are eating pizza. So oh. go anywhere. Just do it. And now there's so many places to do it. You just got to do it. It's all a function of stage time. The more you get on stage, the better you get. That's all there is to it. Hey, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's worldwide. You heard it here first, Mr. Rich Schneider. Make sure, um, I said Schneider, Jesus. Schneider, make sure <laughs> you do. And see, that's what I get for talking fast. I knew I could put that hey, in. Hey, Michael, the- Michael, Michael, do you know how many people have gotten my name wrong over the years? 99% get it wrong every time. You got it right every time but once. And even corrected yeah. yourself. Thank you yeah, very I much, did. sir. I Thank you. myself. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, worldwide, make sure you do go follow him on Facebook, Twitter. Go get the book once again, Kicking Through the Ashes, Amazon.com. Check him out on YouTube. Check out his past shows. If you see him in the streets, say hello to him. Tell him how much of a legend he is. He'll get tired (laughs) of hearing it, but still tell him. Make sure you do it. (laughs) You're great, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. You're great. All right, man. Thank you very much. I would love to have you back on in the future. Anytime, Michael. Anytime, man. Thank you. All right. Until the next time, everybody, on the Bit Scoop with Coop. Uh, you know what time it is. Time to hang out yeah. with Mr. Coop. With Mr. Coopa. With Mr. Coopa. With Mr. Coopa. Get the latest scoop. From Mr. Coopa. From Mr. Coopa. From Mr. Coopa. Hey.